Welcome to this next adventure of Grassroots Health and the data we have to share with you. I'm Carol Baggerly with Grassroots Health and I am delighted uh, to be here to share this with you. Thank you for all of your data and your answers and your participation in this project to help us get new health information out to the general public. What we have to report on today is about diabetes. We have some fantastic new preliminary information that Dr. Cedric Garland is going to talk about. Dr. Garland will be here with us in just a second, and he's going to talk about diabetes and the incidence thereof in our study versus that which is in NHANES, a very large study ongoing as well. Dr. Garland is with the University of California San Diego School of Preventive Medicine and is the primary investigator on this project. Welcome, Dr. Garland. All right. Dr. Garland, thank you for coming. Oh, it's uh, my pleasure to be here, Carol. We have just uh, put together some data from the Grassroots Health Cohort, which shows with diabetes that there is a very significant, possibly as high as 80 or 90 percent reduction in diabetes with higher vitamin D serum levels. Please give me your impression of that data and what you think it means. Well, I think the data are amazing. They're just, I'm so excited to see them. That, you know, they have confirmation in the cohort that vitamin D can prevent uh, diabetes. It's such a terribly serious disease affecting so many millions of people throughout the world that um, we're able to bring under control with vitamin D. It's a grand new era. Is this at all surprising to you? No, it's not surprising. It's okay. just not surprising. All right. And I think it's it's true. Well, we know it's true for type one diabetes. Okay. That everywhere you go in the world, distant from the equator, there's a very high burden of the disease. Sixty-five per hundred thousand, for example, kids get it in Finland, which is at sixty degrees north latitude, whereas it's virtually non-existent anywhere near the equator. So we knew it would be that way for type 1 diabetes, but we didn't have ecological studies for type 2 diabetes, so we were more dependent on studies of individuals. But those studies are revealing, and probably you know, most eloquently the grassroots health studies revealing, that vitamin G D out and out prevents diabetes, that vitamin D out and out prevents diabetes, whether type 1 or type 2, it doesn't seem to matter. I think the interesting thing to me also is that the percent uh, reduction is in the 80 to 90 percent range, which is also what's quoted for type 1, if you can catch that in time. It's kind of amazing, since we have a short period of time and we have a, a, a method that um, you might not think would have the capability of revealing that, particularly with a short time frame, but it must be a very short-term effect. It must happen quite quickly, as it does for, uh, say, premenopausal breast cancer, where it's a matter of uh, a few months that the benefit occurs, and apparently that's what's happening for diabetes. It's a, a very uh, a quick action that vitamin D is able to take to keep the disease from occurring. So if I were an adult person right now that did not have diabetes and I had a low vitamin D serum level, you would recommend what? Oh, well, I'd get to the doctor <laughs> immediately and have your diabetes measured <clears throat> or go to the grassroots health website and have it tested to find D. out what your serum vitamin D level is, the 25 hydroxy vitamin D level, and get it up at least to the, into the range of 40 to 60 nanograms per ml, preferably at the high end of that range. And in, in doing that, you will be responding as quickly as, as possible to the science that's just in a matter of months gotten extremely solid, and the grassroots health cohort will put the bow on the, on the present to humanity of the eradication, in my view, or virtually eradication of diabetes. The comparison that group that Grassroots Health used to see this very significant reduction was the NHANES group. Can you tell us a sentence or two about the NHANES study and why this is a significant control group for us? Well, it is the national sample of people. Uh, it's collected each year from different people to represent the health status of Americans. So we have no better, no larger, no more geographically comprehensive, no more accurate study than the NHANES. And we know from the NHANES that the incidence rate is 8.5 per thousand person years. 
in the grassroots health cohort, which is equally accurately studied, uh, it's only about one uh, per thousand person years. So it's an eightfold difference, and the NHANES really is a gold standard against which all other studies can be uh, compared, and that in that comparison, NHANES uh, really is showing us clearly that the intake of vitamin D in the grassroots health cohort is great enough, and their serum level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D is great enough to eliminate nearly 90% of type 2 diabetes. And the serum level achieved in the grassroots health cohort was right at 48 nanograms per milliliter, for those of you who are wondering what is that magic number that we use to compare. Yes. And in Haines, it was only 21 nanograms per milliliter. So that difference um, made um, a reduction of about 90% of the incidence. That's a key point because um, many physicians and many patients, and even some people who previously were serious students of this, said that, well, if you get your blood up to 20 nanograms per milliliter, that you will um, be fine. They have no problem. But it's not that way at all. If you get it up to 45, you might be fine. You'll get rid of probably 80%. If you get it up to 50 or so, you probably will have a 90% reduction in the incidence of this terrible uh, disease. So it's the time is now to take the action. Dr. Garland, one of the things that I would like to know, or I think our audience would like to know, is can you tell us a little bit about the possible mechanism um, with this prevention of type 2, probably, diabetes here? Sure. A, a, a mechanism emerged as we studied type 1 diabetes, and that is, is that type 1 diabetes is very clearly a failure and ultimately death of the islet cells that make the insulin. And the reason these cells die is that they, um, the barriers that protect them from viruses and other pathogens in the normal course of a child's life are not present. So the viruses penetrate uh, into the islets of Langerhans, the inner sanctums, or sancta if you like, of the pancreas, where the delicate ballerinas, the, the, the little beta cells are located, whose function it is to produce insulin. And they attack the beta cells and they make them very sick. They present antigens on their cell membrane that attract an autoimmune response. And what the virus doesn't do to kill a beta cell, the immune system will do. And therefore we call it an autoimmune disease. But if we kept the barriers sealed, the Chinese walls, if you like, around these inner sancta, millions of them that are located in the pancreas, the viruses would never get in. There would be no killing of the uh, islet cells by the viruses and there would be no stimulation of the autoimmune response because if, if viruses don't make their way into the islet cells, they will not present the antigens that stimulate the release of lymphokines that bring the killer uh, cells, the killer T lymphocytes, to the area and the wholesale killing of the last islet that exists, causing type 1 diabetes and making the patient dependent on insulin for the balance of their life. Wow. On people that have diabetes, what is their prognosis for other diseases? I mean, let's even assume that they are being treated. Then what happens? Well, it, in type 1 diabetes, it's terrible. It's the main cause of organ failure requiring transplantation in the United States. And ultimately, uh, it leads to, it's one of the major causes of non-traumatic amputations in the U.S., probably at the top of the list of causes of non-traumatic amputation. So there's feet and lower legs and uh, extremities that are lost to it. In type 2 diabetes, the initial complications are milder. But unfortunately, many people who have type 2 diabetes, which is not dependent on insulin, get type 1 diabetes as a complication of their type 2. And then they get these same terrible complications that people who had type 1 from childhood get. So by preventing type 2 diabetes, we're, we're helping the people that have a, a, a form of the disease that sometimes is modestly at least controllable to one that's not controllable and, and wreaks havoc with the organs. 
And I assume that for those people that really want to be healthy, that there is more to life than just taking vitamin D. What else should these people be doing that impacts the incidence of diabetes? Well, for people who have type 2 diabetes, the general prescription is to exercise and to uh, lose weight, and usually by reducing the diet caloric intake. Exercise is ideally performed outdoors, where the vitamin D level will even be enhanced by the, the fact of being outdoors, and ideally with enough skin exposed to make vitamin D, which generally speaking means 40% of the total skin area, including the shoulders, which are prominent in the biosynthesis of vitamin D. And a uh, very important aspect of it is to do those lifestyle aspects because it helps us cover all the bases, and it, they should be a very high priority. But at the same time, measurement of vitamin D should be a an annual, at least, concern of people who have diabetes, and preferably it should be done in March when the level is lowest. But it's not a bad idea when people are first easing into this to do it all the time, say every, you know, at any given month, every six months or so, because um, you don't know how successful your vitamin D intake is in raising your 25 OHD, sometimes for a number of months, sometimes it takes a year to be sure. So you don't necessarily want to wait a whole year for the cycle to go into March, but check it in between and see that it's getting up toward that high end of the 40 to 60 nanogram range, which the predominant uh, body of vitamin D scientists have agreed on is the appropriate amount of vitamin D, but is way above the average level in the U.S., which is only in the 20s. Okay. In terms of the size of this problem in the United States, we just looked with you at the CDC statistics, and there are close to 2 million new cases yes, every year. That's right. It's most amazing, and it's tripled since uh, the 1990s, since about 1995. And we don't see a disease that triples very often. It's true for autism. Um, it was true for HIV back in the early days of HIV, but it's really a rarity to see the tripling of incidence of a disease. So something very serious is going on, and we don't necessarily know the triggers for it. But one thing that we do know is if we maintain a high enough vitamin D level, it is unlikely to matter because the disease is being um, prevented at the very basal mechanism, at the point where we're keeping the uh, infecting organisms out and whatever terrible things may be happening in the rest of the society and in the lifestyle of the people, it's very likely we're going to prevent it with vitamin D. We wouldn't have findings that are this powerful if it were not a substantial preventive effect because even in the grassroots cohort there are people that are engaging in all the activities that must be tripling the incidence in the U.S., yet the rate is suppressed to one-eighth of what it would ordinarily be. And how long would it take to prevent this? How many thousands of years? Tongue in cheek. It's <laughs> certainly within a year. This is a short term effect. It does not take very long to happen. So if we pulled out all the stops and said, hey, everybody do it, we'd have a big impact really fast? We'd have a huge impact. Out of those nearly two million, we would eliminate virtually all of them. You know, we'd leave maybe 10% behind, if that. And oh. that, if it were fully implemented on a whole population basis, it's a rarity in, in the history of epidemiology or medicine to have something that acts that quickly and could be implemented as readily and cheaply as we and safely vitamin D and safely. Yes. Two levels yes. in the range of 40 to yes. 60 nanograms. Our next step in order to help this implementation is actually to take this data that we have with your help and that of uh, others on our panel and actually create the scientific publication. Oh, absolutely. Please tell us a little more about why that's so important and what a few of its steps are. Sure. Well, publication establishes through the process of peer review that scientific principles have been followed, they've not been violated, that everything's been done to make sure that those findings are defensible, that they could be reproduced by any other scientist, and that's what makes science different from other ways of knowing, is that we have this very systematic set of procedures that we go through. And a publication is the means of presenting those procedures and receiving confirmation from uh, reviewers and editors that the methods were properly applied. And there's no substitute for it. There's no amount of writing 
nothing you can do as a scientist better than publishing a paper in a peer-reviewed journal that's uh, come under the scrutiny of your colleagues and contributed to the fund of knowledge. So it, it, it's almost to the point where you know, uh, truths hardly enter into decision making unless they have been subjected to that process. So what we're on the threshold of being able to do now with the grassroots health cohort is to write that paper to get it through the process of peer review and into a journal where then it can become the basis for action to virtually eradicate diabetes. And from that standpoint, uh, Dr. Garland, thank you very much for our interview today. Uh, I will add a few more words here to our group about this publication process and how they can help with it. But I thank you very much. It's always a pleasure, Carol. Wasn't that fantastic? Can you imagine being able to possibly prevent such a significant portion of diabetes? We need your help. We need your help to help us sponsor the vitamin D action sponsorship in order to really dig down into this data to see. Is the prevention 90%? Is it 80%? Or somewhere in between? We have to spend the time now to thoroughly analyze this data, get the input of several scientists to take a really hard look at how this process works. For that, we need to raise a sum of $50,000 in order to do the final research to get it published in the peer-reviewed journals and, of course, to develop the public health action materials for everybody to learn from. So please join this Diabetes Health Action Sponsorship. Log on to grassrootshealth.net. You'll see it right there. We would love to have you. Please share this with your friends and help us get the word out. Thanks again for your participation in the project and we look forward to doing more with you.